But today I will cater for this program. And I'm also happy today to be joined by my two very close colleagues. With me here I have uh, Mr. Vainupo Youngblood, who is the Environmental Monitoring and Reporting Advisor uh, here at SPREP. And to his right, we also have my good colleague, Mr. Puta Tofinga, who is the Environmental Assessment and Planning Officer uh, here at SPREP. So today we have uh, an exciting lineup of speakers who will be talking to us about a range of exciting uh, topics, and I can't wait to, to start. But um, as we often do here in the Pacific, we have to start this uh, the right way. And perhaps I'll pass it to my colleague, uh, Mr. Vainupo, to maybe uh, start us off on the right path with a quick word of prayer and to provide some remarks uh, for our webinar today. What do you, uh, Vai? Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, colleagues. Okay. Let us uh, bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this afternoon or this morning for wherever our participants are tuning in from. Uh, to discuss ways and means where we can strengthen environmental impact assessment in our region. As you know, we do have fragile environments that we depend on for our sustenance, Lord. And we thank you for, for all that you have bestowed upon us uh, and with recognition that we are the custodians of our natural environment. So we do have a great responsibility uh, on our shoulders uh, to, to honor what you have provided for us. Please help us in our deliberations and our discussion today so that we may uh, forge a, a sustainable path forward with the work that we are supposed to do that has been entrusted to us. And we pray that you will guide us in our discussions and provide us with, with uh, good insights and, and um, uh, some good thoughts on, on uh, how we can uh, strengthen our collaboration, coordination, and uh, and work together and network uh, for the betterment of our natural environment and for the development within our islands and region. With that, we pray, Lord, that you be with us through uh, the rest of this uh, Talanoa session webinar and guide us. We thank you for your love and your blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, uh, ID. Um, and again, I'd like to welcome uh, all our participants who are. Um, um, uh, tuning in from, from uh, around the region, uh, Taro Falaba. Um, on behalf of the Director General of SPREP and staff of SPREP, uh, I'd like to welcome you all again to this uh, Talanoa hosted by the uh, Pacific Network uh, for Environment Assessment, uh, focusing on uh, good practice, learning and sharing on environmental impact assessment. Um, so very briefly, uh, this webinar aims to foster and engaging uh, so no style dialogue uh, within uh, the PNEA community, a practice focusing on the exchange of knowledge, experience, and best practices in environmental impact assessment across the region. And this is also building on the great discussion and dialogue that uh, uh, occurred around the Pacific Day 2023 at the recent uh, Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand uh, AM's conference uh, in October this year. I think it was a very, very fruitful uh, uh, opportunity or practitioners around the region to share their, their knowledge and skills and experiences and, and uh, look at how we can uh, move forward um, in, in this area. So some of the expected outcomes uh, of the Talanoa session slash webinar uh, today uh, is to strengthen the network among uh, practitioners in EIA uh, across the region. Uh, that we also have a shared understanding of the importance of standardized certification and registration process. Uh, for EIA practitioners or consultants, uh, actionable insights and recommendations for advancing uh, EIA practice standards, and also an increased awareness of digital tools and systems for enhancing environmental assessment. Uh, with those short words, I'll head back to uh, my moderator, Ivan, uh, for uh, further details uh, on the rest of the session today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vainupo, uh, for that uh, opening uh, remarks. So uh, right now, colleagues, we're going to move straight into our program for today. But before then, just perhaps uh, a few housekeeping rules for our webinar today. Uh, as you're all very aware, uh, we kindly ask if you can keep your mics uh, muted when our presenters will be presenting today just so we can keep the echo and the noise to a minimum. 
Um, and I'm sure you also know today we have um, three speakers who will be sharing uh, a range of exciting uh, discussion with us on environmental uh, assessments. So I know you have a lot of questions. And so if you do have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And we'll always uh, raise those questions with our speakers. But also feel free uh, during the Q&A sessions to please unmute yourself, uh, perhaps uh, on height your camera, come online and share a discussion uh, uh, with, the, with the speakers. Uh, we'll also be having a full sort of plenary Q&A session after the whole, after the three uh, presentations. So again, that's another opportunity for discussion uh, so we encourage you all to uh, join and also uh, uh, make your questions or comments or interventions uh, to our speakers. Um, as you also note, we are recording uh, today's webinar. So we will be sharing a copy of the webinar and the presentation slides that our speakers uh, will be sharing today. So to access that, just ensure you're a member of the PNEA and we'll have those resources um, posted on the portal. So enough of us talking. Really today it's about the three speakers that we have uh, joining us for this event. So our first speaker is Ms. Stephanie Brown, who wears uh, several hats. I think uh, Stephanie is the technical uh, principal uh, for planning and environment at WSP. Not sure what, the, what that stands for. Maybe Stephanie can elaborate. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, she provides strategic advice to clients, uh, leads, project teams, and delivers <clears throat> planning approvals and engagement needed uh, to make such projects. She has over 25 years experience, predominantly in delivering infrastructure projects for local communities. Now, her second hat, Stephanie is also the board chair for the Certified Environmental Practitioner Scheme or the CENVP Scheme, as we like to call it. So we're really excited today to have Stephanie to talk about the Certified Environmental Practitioner Scheme, um, how the Pacific can perhaps, be uh, perhaps benefit uh, from this scheme, what challenges exist and how we can, if necessary, replicate uh, similar uh, registration and certification schemes here in the Pacific. And so with that, I will hand it over to Stephanie, who is eagerly uh, waiting to take us to So over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Ivan. And kia ora everyone. I'm sitting here in Christchurch um, in New Zealand. I also have online um, with me Paul Corrigan, who's our program manager, who is based um, in our small office we have in Melbourne. Um, so as Ivan said, I'm just going to give you a bit of a, an overview of the scheme, talk about why certification is important, and then actually start and talk about what the process is involved is, what is involved, um, and particularly around our impact assessment um, process, and just look into some detail on that. Um, and then some time for some questions. Some of you um, may be aware or familiar with the scheme, but I am going to come back and just start um, with a few um, background basics. Um, so the scheme itself, um, it forms part of the Environment Institute um, of Australia um, and New Zealand. Um, and its purpose is to certify um, both environmental and social practitioners. Um, and it was set up really to meet that community and industry um, demand. We do operate under an ISO um, standard, um, which means that we've got certain processes and procedures um, that we need to follow. So as I said, what we're doing as part of that certification process is ensuring that those that we certify are both ethical and competent. Um, and part of that ensures that that process um, ensures that our applications are assessed against stringent um, industry recognized standards. Um, and at the moment we sit out just under 1,200 people across um, Australia and New Zealand um, who are certified. Um, so it is practitioner-led. We have what we call a, a general certification, but we also have a number of um, specialist certifications that you'll see um, up there on the screen. 
is run by its own board. And as Ivan said, um, I'm current chair um, of that board. Um, and a part of our process, we all have also have a an appeals process, a third party complaint process, and that's all to ensure we comply with that ISO um, requirements. A key part of that process is that um, applications are assessed by effectively by peers. Uh, there are three certified practitioners that would sit on an interview panel who then make a recommendation to the board um, about whether someone should um, be certified or not. It is open to any environmental professional. Um, so those of you in the Pacific could actually um, apply now. You don't actually need to be based um, in Australia um, or New Zealand. And as I mentioned, um, with Paul's presence, we do have a small number of paid um, administrative staff um, based in Melbourne, Australia. And so sometimes we often get asked, or you might think, well, what, what's the purpose? Why get certified? Um, some of the key drivers that we're hearing um, from practitioners, and on the right there is a, a recent survey that we did, is part of that is um, giving confidence, um, not only to clients, but also um, to the community. Um, that you effectively are, are trusted to practice and can practice at the right standard um, with ethics and integrity. For some people, it does help um, their uh, career development um, in terms of showing that they've met a particular um, standard. Um, and as I said, for some people also, it um, is helps with their um, CV. So as I talk about the fact we have what we call this, this general certification, certification and number of specialty categories, I'm going to focus a bit today on that impact assessment one, obviously given um, the interest um, of those of you who will be online um, today. Um, it does, to apply, it does require um, effectively 10 years um, of experience, so you show that through your CV and you submit examples um, of your work. Um, and also write some um, short essays, but I'll delve in a minute into the actual applications uh, process. So those figures, as I said, are across Australia um, and New Zealand. There are a number in Australia and New Zealand of regulatory um, government bodies that are increasingly demanding that certified practitioners be the people working um, on projects or involved in projects. And so you can see um, up on the slide there, a number of those logos and, and quotes for them as to why um, and they see the value um, in certification. So as I said, what we are seeing is um, some regulatory demand. And more recently on the right hand slide there was the New South Wales gov state government, the planning um, industry and environment sector of government um, requiring people be certified um, should they want to submit applications impact assessments for what are uh, considered state significant um, projects. So they have set some um, criteria basically um, if you are wanting to submit impact assessments for those large projects. And so we worked with um, the New South Wales Government Planning Department to put together something specific for them. So in terms of looking at the process itself, uh, it is a five step process. Um, I'm going to look uh, at step one, which is around the getting your application in, uh, how it gets assessed um, and what happens um, with uh, the panels. But as I said, following that panel interview, it goes through to the, to the board um, who then does make um, a decision. Um, so the first step really is obviously is to put an application together. It is all done online and there's a whole series of guidance notes on our website to assist you with what is included in that application. And so what um, is involved is that if you are applying, you might need to show that you're competent and as I said, just answer a few short, short essay questions. Um, one of the key things is as part of applying and becoming certified is that you're committing to operate under the EINZ um, Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, which is a really big part of it. And it's no different to a lot of other certification schemes, including, uh, for example, those that you know, go through chartership for engineering. The other thing you're doing is committing to ongoing development. In other words, you're um, continuing professional development, CPD, um, and there's a requirement to uh, do 100 points um, of CPD over a, a two year period, just to show that you are keeping yourself current and in, in your ongoing learning. You also need to show uh, your, your work history, 
um, and we call that work experience verification where um, your previous employers will be signing off and saying, yes, um, Stephanie worked for us, this was the work that she did, um, and these are the dates that she worked for us. And then finally um, is the showing the qualifications to show that you have an environmental background, but also um, supplying to uh, referee reports. Um, at which point, once you assessed as suitable to go through by the registrar, uh, would be your interview. Um, as I said, where there are, th are three CMP people sitting on that interview panel um, and will walk you through a series of questions, including um, some ethical scenarios. They'll ask you to say, uh, what would you do? Um, as I said, all this information sits on our website, so you are more than welcome uh, to go and have a look in detail. And it's the same with the application requirements. As I said, you've just got to have a relevant degree and for the, the general certification, effectively you need five years of full-time experience. But if you're looking at one of our specialist categories, um, you'll, you'll need a longer um, number of years of experience, particularly potentially up to um, 10 years. Um, so just as I mentioned, I was going to look particularly at the impact assessment specialist category, which may be of the one of interest to a, a lot of you. Um, it is around um, demonstrating that you're competent to lead um, and integrate what we call comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary impact assessment um, studies. And I mentioned there's a number of you on the call today who are working in that space. Um, as I said, this was developed um, to focus on certifying those that work in the in impact assessment um, space. Because it's a specialist category, um, there's a bit more information you do have to um, demonstrate and supply with your, um, with your application. And it's around your professional practice, um, your environmental awareness, certain analysis and assessment, but also around um, policy and planning. So all of those, what we call the, the competencies um, are up on our um, website and they get tested as part of your written application and your interview. Um, as I said, there's quite a bit of detail in those slides. I'm just gonna make you aware that um, this information is, is set up on our website. Um, and so you'll get asked about impact assessment methods uh, what your analytical capability um, is in the impact assessment area. Um, and also importantly, um, your interpersonal skills, your engagement skills, your ability to go out there and talk to people, which is often a very key part um, of a project as well. So I've kind of skipped over that um, quite quickly, um, but as I said, there is a lot of information that is up on um, our website. As I mentioned at the start of my presentation, there is no restriction on those of you working the Pacific Islands now from not applying. We don't actually say you must reside in Australia um, or New Zealand. Um, so you could jump online, have a look at our guidance, um, see if you qualify and there would be nothing to stop you from putting um, an application together. But one of the other options, which I talked about what we've done for the New South Wales state government is um, they're now requiring a certain certification for those people who are submitting impact assessments for their what are deemed state significant projects. Um, so we developed, just developed something called the Registered Environmental Assessment Practitioner or REAP as we know it. Um, and so what those people do is they apply for the impact assessment specialist and then they just need to meet the New South Wales um, state government requirements with a short module um, around that. So if it was deemed something that was appropriate, for the Pacific, um, we could add a component, a module on, um, like we have done for New South Wales, which shows that you are particularly competent um, to practice um, in that part of um, the, the, the islands. Um, as I said, um, the scheme, the certification scheme assesses the proficiency and the country at a local level um, assesses um, that they meet the experience criteria. So should you be successful, um, what do you end up with? Obviously you get um, an official certificate, which is shown there on the right hand side, and you get to use the initial CMVP um, after your name, which also means you get supplied with a, a logo, an electronic seal, for example, that you can put on your email signatures. You end up on our online directory um, on our website. Um, but importantly, also, that's the beginning and not the end of your journey in terms of ensuring that you continue to do your um, professional um, development. 
And really importantly, what certification shows is that you've reached a senior level of competency and that has been measured um, by your peers. Um, so we have got time for a, a few questions, um, but uh, we are also um, happy, and that's why I've got Paul on the line too. Um, Paul runs a number of online quite deep dive sessions for people who um, want to um, learn more about it um, and ask a whole lot of questions. So we're more than welcome. Um, if there's interest, um, you can contact us and say, hey, look, could you run us a, a webinar, particularly, say, on the general or on the impact assessment, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, but otherwise, just happy to open it to questions, if there are any there. I see that's a very, very brief overview. Thank you very much, uh, Steph. That was an, an excellent but brief uh, sort of overview of the uh, Certified Environmental Practitioner Scheme. Uh, colleagues, the floor is now open. Uh, if, you have, if you're interested in the scheme, would like to learn more or have any questions that you'd like to pose to uh, Steph and Paul, who's also online, please feel free to drop those uh, questions in the chat or unmute yourself and ask your questions as well. Maybe, maybe to kick off the, the questions, uh, Steph, I'm not sure if you presented about the, you know, sort of cost, you know, associated with being a certified practitioner. Is there any cost, or is there any tiered yeah. costing, or is it the same rate that applies across the board? Yeah, and I think that's a good question. I mean, yes, there is a cost because obviously in the first instance, we need to process your application. Um, so our fees are set in Australian dollars um, and they all up on our website. So if you um, are applying for the general certification, um, and I see Paul's just put that in the chat, everyone, the, the website there, um, they are just under $700. Um, and there's some slight differences for the specialist categories. And then every year you are required to keep your certification current. Um, and there is an ongoing annual fee um, for that uh, as well. But yeah, all those costs are on the website. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Uh, maybe one more question for me before we move on. You did mention that the scheme is open to Pacific Island petitioners to join. My question is, do you have, do you perhaps know if there are any Pacific Island uh, certified practitioners on the scheme? Not sure if that's something you're privy to. Uh, Paul might know, but I do know, and it's not really Pacific Island, we do have someone in the Philippines. Um, so that's just obviously a little bit further outside your area. Um, Paul, are you aware if we've got anyone at the moment who resides in the Pacific? Um, we have someone on one of our um, specialist committees, which is um, we have a specialist committee to look after each of the specialisations, and we have someone based in um, the northeast of PNG, and um, we have 14 certified practitioners in different parts of the world. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head. So in a lot of cases, they may have originally started out or had spent part of their career in Australia and New Zealand, and but have chosen um, to keep uh, their certification. Um, I'm just looking at the questions. So one of the things as a certification scheme is that we don't deliver the continuing professional development, you know, the webinars, those things. So because our practitioners come from a really, really wide range of experience, they might be site contamination people, they might be heritage um, they're ecologists, so often they're also aligned um, with another membership organisation. But obviously, EINZ um, do um, deliver that, that capacity building um, in terms of the, the webinars, the, the, the online or the face to face. Um, and so, those opportunities are actually now open to anyone, um, including yourselves. Um, EINZ have those up on their um, website. Thank you very much, um, Steph. And perhaps just for the benefit and knowledge of our uh, participants today, um, you know, SPREP has a memorandum of understanding with 
EIANZ, that's the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand, which hosts the Certified Environmental Practitioner Scheme. And really the, the idea is for the Pacific to you know, benefit from uh, the scheme and sort of programs that EINZ hosts for its members across uh, Australia and New Zealand. So we're trying to get the Pacific more involved as sort of part of that uh, scheme. And in fact, we did recently uh, participate at the EINZ conference, which was hosted uh, just last month in New Zealand. So again, this is part of sort of the awareness uh, for our Pacific participants to be aware that these schemes exist. And through SREP, you of course have the opportunity to be able to uh, partake and uh, be part of uh, this uh, program that EINZ uh, offers. So uh, thank you very much, Steph. Yeah. I look yeah. at the chat. Perfect okay. timing. No, my, my apologies, I can't stay for the Q&A at the very end. Paul and I have actually got a board meeting um, as scheduled for now. So, But thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and yes. please feel free um, to reach out either through Ivan or through our website. There's email addresses um, on there. So um, enjoy the rest of the, your webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Steph, and all the best with your board uh, meeting. Thank you very much. So uh, colleagues, um, we'll just move straight into our next uh, presenter. And I'm pleased to note that we also have Miss Rosie Davey um, online with us. And Rosie is a senior environmental specialist with the World Bank uh, based in the Sydney office. Of course, Rosie, uh, Rosie is a very close friend of SPEP, and I'm sure many of you online as well will perhaps uh, have worked uh, with Rosie in some capacity. Uh, in fact, she was just Samoa two weeks ago uh, with us. But now, today, she's joining us from Ulaanbaatar. That's all the way in uh, Mongolia. So we appreciate you, uh, Rosie, for making the time today to uh, be with us and to enlighten us on sort of environmental and social management uh, systems. This is a question that we get a lot from our members and it's great to have you today just to help us sort of break down the discussion and maybe talk to us about how we can sort of strengthen uh, these systems in the Pacific. So with that, I'll pass it over to Rosie to lead our Talanoa. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Ivan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join today's session and present. Um, I realize it's a busy time of year and everyone's getting quite tired by this point, so I'm hoping to get some participation and lots of questions from the group. So please do just jump straight in if you've got any questions or comments. Oh, why can't I change my... There we go. I'm not super technologically competent. so. I'm going to talk about what an environmental and social management system is, um, look at the process that you would go through to develop one, um, and then have a bit of a chat about how this can help um, meet donor requirements as well as um, local legislation. So an environmental and social management system is a structured system to help manage your environmental, social and health and safety impacts and, and to improve your performance. Um, here, I've just lumped it all into one. Um, you'll often see that people will often have separate environmental management systems and health and safety management systems. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's an institutional choice what you choose. So the basic premise of an environmental and social management system is that you start off with planning. So you look at what are you, what's your policy, what are your objectives, that kind of thing. Then it's do. So this is developing your procedures for your key risks and impacts, um, how you'll do training, how you'll do communication, then check. So you've got your ESMS in place. You need to now check how well it's working. So that's monitoring, auditing, that sort of thing. Then act. And this comes down to reviewing how your ESMS is performing so you can make um, adjustments as needed. And I'm going to talk through each one of those steps. Um, the big advantages to having a structured environmental and social management system is that it will help you ensure regulatory compliance 
And it might also and should also simplify your interactions with donors. So, you know, for example, with the World Bank, we have the environmental and social framework. Um, having a good, well-structured ESMS will help you comply with that um, and reduce the burden during project preparation and implementation. Um, from my experience back in my pre-World Bank days, when I worked on sort of mine and mining and processing sites, one of the things I found most valuable about the environmental and social management system was that it's an expression of senior management's intent towards environmental and social risk management. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we how you can use that as a tool um, further in the slides. But I know working in the Pacific, I've heard quite regularly that one of the challenges that practitioners often have is not having the support from their um, senior management. Um, and then it's there to improve your environmental so and health, social and health and safety outcomes. Um, and it's a good tool to help with budgeting. And we'll discuss that later on as well. So this talks about the steps towards developing your ESMS. So developing your policy, making sure you have responsible people for implementing the ESMS, um, looking at your activities, interactions with the environment, community and workers, um, and the potential impacts that you might have on them. Um, what are your legal and other requirements? So World Bank, we would fall under other. Um, establishment of your objectives, targets, um, how you'll do your monitoring and measurement, um, how you'll review um, system performance. And then it's all about continuous improvement, basically. So just keep going round in that circle, getting better and better and better. Okay, so this first one shows an example of a policy that's been developed. So this is your first step to put your policy together. So I apologize for this being an Australian example, but I couldn't find a disclosed equivalent for a Pacific organization. Um, but I do know that say Fiji Roads Authority, um, Department of Works in PNG and PNG Power Limited, they've all been working on um, developing environmental and social management systems, so they do exist. So the elements to include in your policy are looking at continuous improvement, um, prevention of environmental, social, health and safety impacts, um, compliance with legal and other requirements, and the framework for your objectives and, tar and um, targets. So this is the bit that really needs to come top down. So you need good engagement from top management with this uh, because it's going to be the directive and the guidance for how your organization manages environmental, social and health and safety risks. And obviously that has costs and resourcing implications. So the policy will effectively be meaningless if your management aren't on board um, and supporting you with resourcing this. The next step is to identify the organization's aspects and impacts. So I've included some environmental examples here, um, and this is going to developing an environmental and social aspects and impacts register. So an aspect is any part of the organization's activities that might impact the environment or I guess communities and workers. Um, and then an impact is the effect of a particular aspect has on the environment. So I've included some environmental examples here. Um, does anyone have any suggestions for what may also go in that list? Um, it could also come from the social side or the worker health and safety side. This is where I find out whether, whether everyone's awake and engaged or if you're going to leave me hanging. Drop your thoughts in the chat, uh, colleagues. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Rosie, maybe noise, noise pollution. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then another example would be, so the aspect would be, let me see if I can get this straight in my head. Um, actually, we can do, okay, so under fossil fuel usage, it's not just that it leads to air pollution. You would also have a second impact there that it's consumption of a finite natural resource. 
So when you're doing an impact aspects and impacts register, it wouldn't just be one impact under each aspect. Um, the other one that you might look at is um, the aspects would be workers being injured. And then the impact might be, you know, serious injuries, fatalities, um, that kind of thing. But you would look at the different areas that might cause that. So if you're a road project, um, worker or pedestrian interactions with heavy plants, that kind of thing. So I won't let you move on. OK, so then you develop your impacts, aspects and impacts register. So this is very similar to a risk register, which I expect most people are fairly familiar with. So aspects, you're looking at what activity you're doing. Impacts, list your impacts. Then you need to understand the severity and the likelihood of that um, happening to do your significant score. So this is how you will rate the importance of the activities and the risks and impacts um, and how much effort you would put into controlling them. So then you'll list the legislation and you'll talk about the type of controls that you would put in here. Um, this is one of the things I used to use as a tool a lot in my site work days. So I would do the aspects and impacts of reg register with um, inputs from different parts of the organization. So you want to talk to your engineers, you want to talk to your procurement. Um, you know, we have environmental and social impacts associated with procurement as well. So get the relevant experts in, sit in a room and put it together. And then you take it to senior management for endorsement. Once senior management have endorsed your environmental and social risks and impact register, you can then look at putting your budget together based on that. And it gives them a little bit of a push to then have to endorse your budget because they've agreed at that point that that stuff is important and needs to be done. Um, next step is to put together standards, procedures and guidelines. So you can group some of the things that have come up in your aspects and impacts register. So for example, air emissions, you might look at um, dust, other types of discharges, do your procedure that includes the mitigation measures you've identified. Um, that procedure then needs to be communicated to you who it's going to impact. Um, people will need training, that kind of thing. Um, in a lot of your procedures, it's also important to consider emergency preparedness and response. So examples would be on the spill side. What happens if you have a significant hydrocarbon spill? How will you address that? Um, and then on the health and safety side for worker accidents or community accidents, that sort of thing. Um, we've included, I've just included an example of the type of procedure you might have in the picture. Um, so storage and transport of chemicals, but there are many others that you will also need for your system. Um, checking, so this is for monitoring. Um, so there are two types of checking. So first is your routine monitoring. So your procedures, for example, if you have a discharge into a river or you're doing um, physical works in a river, like a water crossing, your procedure should probably say that you'll be doing um, water sampling up and downstream to look at the impacts you're having on that river and understand that. The other side of checking is doing assurance and auditing. So how do you know that your system has been implemented? And there are different levels of assurance. So you've got your formal audits. So you bring someone external in um, and they you ask them to do a formal audit against the procedure. Um, the next level down would be you go and do your scheduled site inspections. Um, but then there are some really good tools there as well to check whether things are working. Um, and it's not just you as environmental, social health and safety practitioners that should be doing this. Um, you need to get your management along for the ride, get the engineers along for the ride and go and do things like safety interactions with workers. So try and keep it to a small group, go out on site um, and have the conversation of, OK, so what task are you doing? Can you please talk me through the type of risks and impacts? Like what worries you about doing this task and how are you managing those risks and impacts? And do you, you know, do you think that's sufficient? So it doesn't even matter if you don't really understand the task they're doing. You know, maybe health and safety isn't your area of expertise. The worker who is doing that work will, will know exactly what the risks are um, and they'll be able to tell you. And listening to them talk, you'll get an idea for whether they understand what they're doing and whether they're doing it safely. So that's one of my favorite tools to use when I go out on site inspections for this. Then it goes to manage, management review. So this is how you drive your continuous improvement. Based on the monitoring, you'll be doing regular reporting. And this reporting should be fed up to senior management. 
so they know how the organization is um, performing with respect to environmental, social, health and safety performance. Um, I would recommend when you're looking for improvements that it needs to come bottom up. So, you know, you as practitioners, workers on site, you need to be feeding ideas up for management endorsement, but you also want management to be really engaged and to be looking at the reporting and to be pushing improvements from their side as well. Any questions on the ESMS? development before we talk about the donor requirements. I realize I've just rushed through something that's actually pretty complex to do in reality, um, but please look at it as a taster. And Ivan, I can't actually see if anyone writes a comment, so please do let me know if they do, but I think I'm gonna get radio silence. Uh, yes, no, no comments uh, so far. I think they're all very clear. So when I know I'm going to use um, PNG Power Limited as an example, they've been working with DFAT and a little bit with us to develop their environmental and social management system. And they're doing this because they've been struggling with working with several different donors um, and meeting their environmental, social health and safety standards consistently. So they want to stop doing these project specific instruments or reduce the amount of project specific instruments and be able to refer to their own environmental and social management systems. Um, when you look at the example of the World Bank's environmental and social framework, which is how we guide the requirements for ESHS performance on our finance projects, you can see how it kind of lines up. So it's set up, it's got its vision for sustainable development, then sitting under there, it's got its environmental and social policy, and then we have 10 standards. Um, we also do monitoring and we do review of performance. So you can see how it goes in that same circular process. Um, if, for example, you were doing a substantial risk, I don't know, road development project, road construction project, um, rather than having to do write about all the individual controls, if you have a good, robust environmental and social management system, you could have a very short document that's specific to those works. And that, that then refers to your environmental and social management system procedures, standards, that kind of thing. Um, it would just, you know, it will simplify things. The other thing that's happening within the World Bank is that we're looking at some streamlining. So I won't talk about a lot of it because it's sort of internal processes, um, but I'm sure anyone who's working on a World Bank finance process, project will understand that the bank review process is pretty tedious. So, you know, it comes to us and then it goes back to you. Then it comes to a level above us, then it goes back to you. And then sometimes a third level. So internally, we've done some work to try and reduce the length of that review process. But what's most relevant to participants here is that for low and risk moderate projects, sorry, low risk and moderate risk projects, there's gonna be an increased drive to use um, government and organization systems and frameworks. So more borrower system use. Um, we will still have to supplement with individual documentation where there, are big, where there are material gaps for compliance. So this is one of the ways by strengthening your ESMS, um, you will be able to implement these World Bank finance projects much more easily um, and have to do a lot less work during project preparation. You know, it'll allow you to say, yes, our environmental and social management system applies. Um, we've developed it in compliance with the World Bank environmental and social framework. Or you may look at the um, common approach from PROF. So then that will cover various donors. Um, and then you can say, look, we don't need to supplement this. We, we have this in place and then um, we'll ask for contractor environmental and social management plans in accordance with that, um, that kind of thing. So it's a good opportunity to simplify the approach to project preparation. Um, the last slide I think I wanted to touch on is just to mention that there are ISO standards for both environment and health and safety at work. Um, these are really good standards to have a look at. Um, 
whether you want to be certified to them or not. So there are two options you can go with. You can develop your environmental and social management system in alignment with ISO 14001 and 45001. Um, and that means you just, you know, you follow the steps they ask for, you tick off the compliance, you might do your own internal audit of it, but you don't go through the time consuming process of bringing someone in to do formal ISO audits and get that certification. Um, then the other option is to go through the sort of formal certification process. But I would encourage everyone to have a look at on the ISO site. Um, there's lots of resources out there, lots of guidance about how to develop these um, management systems. Okay, first, I'm interested to hear whether anyone in the group has been involved in developing environmental and social management systems within the Pacific um, and what your experiences have been. Um, and then just going on to whether you have any questions, please. Thank you so much, uh, Rosie, for that uh, presentation. And thank you for starting up our discussion. So colleagues, the prompt is right there uh, before you all. Um, what has been your experience uh, with ESMS? I'm sure a lot of you have had some experience there. So feel free to jump online or drop in the chat what your experience uh, has been. But while uh, we're doing that, we also had some questions uh, in the chat, uh, Rosie. So we have a question here from the Ngata Tao, who asks, how is auditing performed? Is it by way of surprising or taking other options? Please share. Okay, my recommendation would be to develop an audit plan for the year, and I would include a variety of that. So the big bonus of a planned audit is people prepare for it and they fill gaps. Um, and that forces them or pushes them to strengthen their systems. However, what also often happens is um, they then let go of that once you're offsite. So my recommendation would be to do a combination of planned and communicated audits and inspections um, and surprise as well to try and close some of those gaps. Um, just sharing one experience, I've been on a World Bank site inspection and there was a poster up saying the World Bank are coming. Um, please bring your old PPE from home and make sure you're wearing it for the day. So we want to avoid, you know, having one day of good performance. Um, you know, you want to know you can come back in a month's time without anyone knowing you're there and they'll still be doing it. So yeah, I definitely recommend a combination of the two. Excellent. Thank you, Rosie. Another question here from uh, Rolini. Rolini, in fact, has been very interested in you know, ESM and ESMS, and uh, she's been asking a lot of questions. And one question she asked here is, how can we approach the World Bank in regards of implementing EMS? So if you're looking for bank support for implementing the ESMF, I would, ESMS, sorry, I would suggest trying to tack it onto a project that is bank financed under preparation or even one that's an implementation, it's worth discussing the opportunities for the project to finance some technical assistance to help you with this work. So I'm gonna take the PNG Power Limited example. Um, DFAT have led the ESMS development, you know, the structure and the framework of it, but what we've been doing, or we're going to do more of as part of our energy projects in PNG is, one, use the environmental and social specialists who are part of the project implementation unit to develop some of those procedures and that sort of thing. Um, and two, we're looking at the opportunity to have budget for technical assistance to come in and do some of those more complex and specialized things. So, for example, for an organization that large to develop a good waste management procedure, someone needs to go on site, do inspections of every site, understand all the waste streams. Um, be aware of what the storage options and what the transport options and disposal options are. You know, it's quite a big bit of work just to do that one procedure. Um, so yeah, those are the ways that you can do it. But my biggest piece of advice is to get in early. So when you're preparing a project, be it with us, ADB, DFAT, whoever, is push for what you want. So, you know, we want help strengthening or strengthening or developing our ESMS. 
Um, and these are some of the particular technical areas that we would need assistance with. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Rosie. And I think we have a couple of more questions here in the comments, so I'll just read them out very quickly. Um, we have a comment here from Margaret. Uh, she says, the challenge with implementing ESMS is the lack of availability of local standards to measure performance against. Example, water quality, discharge of wastewater from concrete batching plants. This so, is more of a comment rather than a question. You've got a couple of options there. Either you rely on the international standards if they apply to your conditions. So I realize that sometimes that's challenging and sometimes they're just not, you know, for example, developed for a tropical environment. Um, the other option is that you need to do some baseline studies um, which I guess you need to do baseline studies anyway. So do your baseline studies and then look at developing your own criteria based on that, which is a fair chunk of work. Um, the third option would be for to assist or support regulators or ministries such as, um, I'm going to say, MISE in um, Kiribati. So working with MISE, to help get baseline water data um, on projects like the um, sanitation project that the World Bank is financing over there. So you can use the donors to finance work for getting those that baseline data. And then the next step is to work with the regulator to try and integrate some of the standards into legislation. And I think that's actually what Kiribati is doing, isn't it, Puta? Puta nods, nods his head. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have one more question here from Victoria Nangi, who's also from Kiribati. So Victoria says, uh, compliance of local contractors or clients, often government agencies, to national environmental safeguard systems, donor-funded projects or not, is sometimes an issue to regulators. Does World Bank funded projects see that clients are compliant all throughout the project phases in supporting national regulators? So the general approach on that is we require national compliance. However, it's not the focus of what we're monitoring on. Um, what we are trying to do more of, though, is inviting the regulator along on our inspections so we can share one share our knowledge and get aligned with what we're looking for on site. Um, and two, we're giving consolidated feedback. And then sometimes it can help with regulators having budget to get out to site and that sort of thing as well. Um, what we do ask, though, is that the environmental and social instruments cover national legislation. So national legislation is the baseline of um, compliance required, but it's not us going out there and doing those inspections to check on national compliance. However, when we see something, we will raise it. Does that answer the question, Victoria? It does. Victoria says it does. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, uh, Rosie, and thank you so much, uh, everyone. I think we have one last comment there from Margaret that maybe I'll read out before we move on. And I think Margaret is asking, can you share some templates for monitoring and auditing inspections? What do you think, uh, Rosie? Um, Margaret, please, can you, if you speak to Ivan, he can give you my contact details and let's work out specifically what you're looking for and I'll see what I can find. Um, there are a lot of general resources out there, so I'm sure we can work something out. Thank you, Rosie. And please, Margaret, uh, just send me a quick email reminder and I can forward your request to uh, Rosie and the team. OK, so thank you so much again, uh, Rosie. Uh, and thank you for making the time all the way from Ulaanbaatar. Uh, I hope it's early there and not late. So <laughs> hopefully you're not uh, inconvenienced. But we appreciate uh, the discussion uh, today. So thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Yes. Great to 
the opportunity to talk to everyone. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. So we have one more presentation uh, today, colleagues, and this is also a very um, exciting one. And I'm glad to introduce my good friend, Mr. Benjamin Maxwell. Uh, Benjamin Maxwell is a senior compliance officer with the National Environment Service in the Cook Islands. And we wanted to really invite uh, Benjamin today to talk to us about some of the innovation and digitization that's happening at the National Environment Service. So uh, just last month uh, at the EINZ uh, conference, uh, we did hear from Benjamin about uh, sort of e-permitting system that the National Environment uh, Service in Cook Islands is implementing and uh, testing out. And I think a lot of our participants from the Pacific were really intrigued uh, about this system, and they wanted to sort of see more and hear more about this system. Perhaps if they can uh, take some lessons and apply uh, these digitization efforts in their own uh, countries. So today we're very uh, glad to have Ben from uh, National Environment Service to introduce this system to us and perhaps share with us any challenges or any gaps uh, Cook Islands has faced and perhaps how other countries in the region can uh, adopt similar systems. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to my good friend, uh, Ben. Yorana, Ben. Kirana, Kirana, Ivan, Kirana, everyone uh, from the Cook Islands. Uh, Ivan, thank you for inviting me to be one of the guest speakers um, for this very important uh, discussion this afternoon. Okay, just a brief history um, how the Cook Islands started going into e pivoting. Uh, previously to when we, before we started uh, e pivoting, um, we were still doing the old paper uh, filing uh, type of processing. And um, when our new director came on board, Mr. Halatua Poor, he, he wanted to make it more digital, making it more accessible online. And um, so, yeah, that's how all the, the push and the drive for our e permitting systems to be documented and also processed online. So part of that um, whole uh, shift and improvement was we had to go and um, improve. One was our website. As you can see uh, in the slides, we have our National Environment website. This, this is a newly improved uh, website. Our old website was just a normal type of website. Well, with this one, you have all these drop downs and pop up um, tabs. So, where I'm going to take you guys is this one the applications and permits. So, this one sits underneath our division, which is the um, Environmental Compliance Division. So, we're the ones that deal with uh, EIAs, applications for any type of developments here in the Islands. So, Underneath here, we created this tab and also part of this. Tab. It, it explains how you can go about applying for applications for EIAs, um, building permits, uh, even engineering reports and for any types of developments here in the Cook Islands. So this explains it. And we've got um, three different processes. So we've got the environmental approvals. So when you click on that, it provides all the details of what an environment approval is, the type of activities they will fall under, and the, the processing from the time you apply, process map right up to when it gets approved. So including that also includes the environments of consent and then our e e EIA permitting too as well. So when you click on the EIA permitting detail, I think the internet in some was slow. 
So there you go. It has a whole drop down of what type of projects clarifies uh, EI projects. And these are some of the examples that these are projects that have happened here in the Cook Islands, but this is it's not limited to only these. So there, as we all know, there are upcoming and new interventions of type of projects coming out from out in our Pacific Islands. So we need to stay on top of all of that. So we also have our process map that explains, even gives you timelines on processing day times. And also part of that is for us to also be engaged with the applicant to make sure that they are kept engaged and updated of the progress of their, their application. And also you can uh, apply online by using our website. You can apply online and your application gets sent to our department and we will assess your application and we will make the recommendation of which process suits your development. Or you can go ahead and download our application form. We also have a fact sheet. That's also part of this whole upgrade was to have an information sheet for the public and the community to also read and try and understand our process before coming to us and applying. We also have a registration form for science and technical experts. Uh, I can see that one of our um, renowned local engineers is also part of the discussion board, uh, part of the Remember this on the chat, uh, on the webinar, Mr. Paul Mauti. So they, they can register here and then we'll go through a vending process. Here are some of the ones that are already registered with us. And uh, there you go, Paul Mauti's name is right there. And um, yeah, so we have a lot of uh, local engineers that uh, work along with us in terms of providing the EI reports the technical report, and um, also they can come in when we ask them to for advice in terms of some developments or if we need technical information or assistance. So that's our website. So part of our uh, drive to moving into e-permitting was to update our website to make sure that uh, our information gets out to the community outside of the Cook Islands and also um, our people here in Islands too as well. So that's our website. <clears throat> then we created our e-registration. So this is our e-permitting re registration where all the projects that we receive by applicants to documented in here. They give it, they get given a permit number, the data was received, the name of the applicants, and then the key contacts. And then over here, we've got a tab here that where all the documents and um, files get saved in. So you can open that up and it'll take you to that client's uh, document details. We're using Google Sheets. So Google Sheets was the first um, software that we used. The thing about Google Sheets, it's free. So everyone that has a Google account, you have access to Google Sheets, Google Drive, Google Docs, everything that Google has to offer. And um, this is where we do all our creating and all that. <clears throat> So yeah, that's um, uh, Google Sheets. So we use Google Sheets last year and the beginning of this year to document all our um, our projects that we've been receiving over the last year or two. And then processing them becomes really effective, efficient. Now we don't carry documents or files. Like if you have 10 projects to monitor or check up, you don't have to carry all 10 files in your truck. You can just carry them on your phone. So 
everything gets stored on the Google Drive and then the Google Drive should be on your phone and then you can take your files with you. And if you see any updates when you're out on the field, you can take photos from your own phone camera and just load it up straight into that um, Google file. <clears throat> the shell, uh, so here's an example of um, the Google Drive. So these are all the documents that we deal with or the files that some of these projects are saved in. And then the shell, just before we went for the the INZ uh, conference in Oakland, um, our director introduced us to another software that will that's it's not cheap. I mean, it's not free, um, but it's a lot more advanced in terms of uh, managing our time and also the processing of our projects. So now we just completed a training with Asana. So as you can see, these are all the projects now. So everything that was on our Google Sheets is now stored in here. And it shows the processing uh, timelines up here, in process, applicant on hold, applicant persist. Then over here with the permitting process. Yeah, so it just takes all the projects right up to the approval end right here. So this project was approved last week. This is what it looks like. Project number, information. Good thing about this too, you can post it on um, GIS mapping to give you a better location of where it is, um, the type of project it is, the section of the act, the area of concerns, approved, is it a high priority? Then you keep going down. Then over here, you can even uh, store, um, upload the approval letter and also the link to where most of the documents are, still, are stored. So this is a more advanced uh, monitoring system or e-permitting system. And um, yeah, the challenges that we faced since starting this whole process was um, moving from something that we were very comfortable with and very um, good at doing and moving into a new type of uh, processing. Um, and not only that, I've got Matt and uh, Junior that's also on, on as part of the audience who can also contribute to some of the challenges that we face in the office. One of it is the transition. Um, um, some were quicker to transit, uh, to pick up the new process. Some took time, but here in our office, we work as a team. So if we see someone else's um, struggling, we, 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 we lend our, our, our hand to them just to encourage them or improve. And we train ourselves as we go. We, we teach each other. If we learn something new, we found something new, a shortcut, um, we share it with the rest of the team. So yeah, so this is our new system that we're using now. It's not perfect. We still have a, a few things that we need to understand it more, but overall it's, um, yeah, it's helpful. The only thing about this new Asana system is um, it can't operate offline. So if you've got no internet, it doesn't work. So we, we, we're keeping our Google Sheets uh, registry there as well. So in case um, we go out of offline, we can still use Google Sheets. Google Sheets is still accessible offline. So this one comes on and then we just load everything back on when we get into it. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges is making sure you have um, sufficient or good good internet. Um, the other one is um, um, being accountable to make, making sure that you're up to date 
your sign of tasks, making sure that you stay on top of it. It's got a time management type of uh, system. So if you're task a, a task, and because of our Google, I mean, our fact sheet that are already out in the public, some of the people are picking us, picking on us in terms of our men, uh, assessment uh, timelines. So if on our fact sheet is five days to assess a project, we have to stay within that five days and give them updates after the five days. So yeah, that's that's the other one is the transition, some of those challenges, but uh benefits is it's uh, really made things efficient uh our service to the uh, the community much more efficient and even giving them live updates and showing them where their project is is uh yeah it's a big um big tick on our part and um yeah so if there's any questions, I, I've got two colleagues that are on too. They can also jump in and um, answer some questions. But that's where the Cook Islands is at the moment. Um, it's still a work in progress. But um, yeah, having this e system, e permitting system is really took us to another like, step up and keeping in track with um, keeping on top of our form out there and ICI's developments here in the Cook Islands. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Hey, Taki, uh, Matt, uh, Ben, thank you so much for that uh, excellent sort of uh, walkthrough of your digital uh, systems. You guys are really uh, embracing uh, digital tools uh, in Book Islands, and that is great to see. I do have some questions myself, but I see that. Uh, some of our participants have also dropped some comments and questions in the chat. So maybe I'll pose those to you. Uh, we have Mandra here. I think Mandra makes a comment. Uh, she says, Asana is brilliant. Glad to see another agency using it. So it appears Mandra is also using the, the Asana um, system. Yeah. Uh, we also have another sort of question from Sally Peter, and I think it touched on the comment you made. She's asking, how long did you take for your transition from hard copies, sort of, you know, the standalone paper reports, to that online system? Um, it took us a month long to make sure that we get our um, website and everything that's posted on our website, correct. So a month with our website and then transiting from paper, we still use paper, document papers, but now if you look at our folders, it's not as thick as what it was before. You know, everything is just a thin layer, but uh, transiting from paper into electronic processing was um, in a matter of just a couple of weeks. So I built the, the Google Sheets uh, registration, uh, e-permitting re registration. Um, it's like using Excel, basically, but just online. The, the good thing about having it online is when you're editing, everyone else that's got the link to it, get have access to it, can also see you editing that project live. And uh, yeah, and yeah, the transition wasn't that long, two weeks. But then throughout the whole year last year, it's just improving and just fixing all the little, uh, how you say, uh, laziness of some of our, our staff here and myself too as well. Sometimes you come back from lunch, you just come back from monitoring a project, you come back and it's lunchtime, you just put the, monitoring form down and go go to lunch. But then um, after that, we, we've encouraged our staff that the Google Sheets is available on your phones too as well. So you just need to make sure you download the, the, the link and you can access the Google Sheets on your phone. So from then on, people were updating their 
documents while out on the field, as long whether there's a internet or not, you can still update it. But once you get in range with internet, everything gets pushed by uh, updated onto the the web onto uh, onto the online system. And now we're in Asana. We've also encouraged our staff now to download the Asana app, and I'm sure. Everyone in our office now has downloaded the app. And I've seen some staff updating their their projects, their tasks um, using their own phones because they're not sitting behind their computers at work. So they should be using it on their phones or somewhere they have access to a sign up. But yeah, the transition wasn't as long as as expected. But yeah, hopefully I answered your question. Wow, that's uh, surprising to hear. Uh, transition of only a month. I mean, you must have some really tech savvy people in the office because you know where we are. <laughs> it will take people much longer to you know acclimatize and get used to these uh, new systems. That's really uh, great to hear. Uh, yeah. I also see a hand from Paul online. So please, Paul, you have the floor. Hey, good on everyone. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Ben, for for uh, for that for saying my name three times. Uh, <laughs> only fair by coming um give support to our colleagues uh, from the, the environment service. Uh, I can confirm it. It was uh um very impressive for their delivery of this uh transition from the old um uh, system to the new one. But I, uh, um, I think Ben is a bit modest in not not saying further stuff. So what what this has improved because uh, for the Cook Islands we are very into our social networking, and this has improved especially with our connectivity with the community and other um, key agencies. Uh, the fact sheets are very useful. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, when we have uh, consultations. Just sharing those uh, fact sheets around it just um, improve everyone's um, uh, understanding on how best to go about with the planning of their projects. And not just that, it gives them an upfront view of the um, challenges or issues they'll face. So that for us as engineers, that sort of um, done some, some of our jobs. So I uh, thank you, Ben and, and his team. And um, yeah, because um, for most of us, we have websites, but no one uses it. But when we're linking it with uh, social welfare, it improves that. And then also it, it gives a place because um, these things don't stay in your mind for too long. And uh, it's always important to have a reference guide. Maybe three or six months from now, you say, oh, I'm sure we discussed this project. Let's go back to the website. Voila, it's there. So that's one of the good things I've seen with this. So it stops us from, you know, going to communities, going to um, agencies and discussing something we discussed five years ago. So uh, thank you, Ben and the team. And um, and Ivan, yep, thank you for the opportunity for the mic. Get on, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Now, as always, we're working oh. with uh, ICI and Paul and his team uh, just to improve both, both systems, ICIs and, and ours too as well. But that also goes with uh, the other government uh, uh, ministries out there here in the Cook Islands. Uh, yeah, that's one of the, the main goals here at National Environment Service is to work hand in hand with uh, the rest of our ministries here in, in, in the Cook Islands, including our private sectors too as well. Thank you, Ben. And of course, uh, thank you so much, Paul. You know, Ben, it's great to hear, you know, a stakeholder like Paul actually, you know, praising and raving about the uh, the system you're implementing. So that means it's working. And, you know, uh, like you said, the private sector is certainly uh, seeing the benefits. Um, one question I wanted to ask just before I move on to another comment here is with the new system you're implementing, what volume, what number of sort of hard uh, paper applications do you get compared to the online applications? Do you still get a lot of physical applications or do you see more 
sort of online EIA uh, permit applications now? Um, uh, paper paper applications have decreased um, rapidly. I, I would say about ten percent. Oh, no, nah, that's a bit too much. Uh, uh, you can say about twenty percent. Uh, we, we, we've got paper, you have paper applications, but the majority are now taking on the the online um, application applying for for projects. And the good thing is our emails are accessible online too as well. So people are emailing and we're sending them the documents and they're sending it back to us. So, and the processing uh, stays online too as well. But we mm. still print out, there are still um, stakeholders out there that still prefer uh, hard copies. So we still print out hard copies for, for their convenience. But I can say, yeah, there's been a big drop in terms of paper printing, including when we have our authority meetings too, uh, on a monthly basis. What was before we used to do a heavy printing for each of the projects. Now they only get eight copies of the project projects and um yeah so we don't see a lot of printing coming out of our office uh for our rea meetings for our authority meetings to discuss development projects so it's been a, a, a huge um, bonus in terms of paper processing saving paper <laughs> that's always great that's always great i mean 80 percent of uh, your EIA permit applications now are coming online, so that's that's a you know impressive uh, number right there. So you and the team should be very uh, very proud of that. But also going back to your you know comment about saving paper, you know when it comes to the EIA reports themselves, you know, these are quite thick, heavy documents. Can you through your EIA permitting system, the online one? Can you also accept the EIA uh, reports uh, online, or is that still done sort of manually with uh, physical paper? We still we still accept that online. Yeah, it comes yeah. online. We do all the review process online, and then we share it to our technical team online, and then they share their uh, re response to each of those um, EIA projects uh, reports, and then it gets processed and then it goes to our authority for um, for the meeting. Even publications too, for the 30 days publications, public viewings, everything is digital. So when we post it on our website, we post it uh, in our social media, and then we'll give our Google Drive link, but it's only for viewing, not editing. So they just view and read. And yeah, nothing gets, no hard copies get sent to shops like how we used to do it before. We used to print 20 to 30 copies of EI reports and share it around the island. Now we just post it on social media, our website, and we go on our um, local TV and uh, advise them that these are the, the links and the, yeah, the sites that the reports are available online. And yeah, it's been a, a big help. Now a lot of, now everyone has a mobile phone, they can access a website and with data coverage yeah, around, the, around the island everyone can access it if they need it. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have a couple of more sort of comments here in the chat. And we have a comment from Matthew Sullivan. He says, uh, I have re I recently moved to the Cook Islands and as part of my work with infrastructure Cook Islands, I have used the NES website to start my planning for a permit on a project I am working on. 
and I found it very easy to use. Good to see what goes on behind the doors at NES. Great work, Benjamin and team. You've been getting a lot of nods today, uh, Ben, so <laughs> that's great to see. <laughs> and, and we have a, sort of a question here from Bruce Sairoy. Hello, Bruce. So Bruce is asking, is the e-permitting system used in the Cook Islands the same as the system called electronic single window system that some countries are using? I'm not sure if you've heard of that before, Ben. Electronic yeah. window system. Uh, it may be the same, but I, I, haven't, I haven't heard of that that system before. Maybe I can search it up when uh, after the webinar and just have a read. Uh, maybe it could be the same, just different softwares being used. So mm -hmm. at the moment, we were using Google Sheets. And like I said, we moved to Asana. So I encourage um, the rest of the Pacific, um, my brothers and sisters in the Pacific, Google Sheets is good because it's free and uh, start practicing on it. Um, and uh, yeah, create create anything on it. And with Google Drive right, right next to it, it will support it big time. And yeah, I'll be happy to come to your, to your country and uh, help develop it and I'll uh, build it for you if you if you need me to, with the support of Sprit, uh, Sprit. and I can bring one of my team, Matthew Dimo, with me, and Junior, because now Junior is on the link. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I haven't heard of that um, system, but I'm sure it's it's the same, mm -hmm. same system. It's just different softwares or different methods of use. Thank you, thank you, Ben. And uh, Bruce, uh, I also haven't heard of the electronic uh, window system. I wonder if you have heard about that. Uh, <laughs> so we're all very new to that uh, system, but if you have some experience or knowledge about that system, please uh, feel free to uh, share more information with us. Um, I also have another comment here from Junior. But first of all, I think uh, Sally here just Thank you, Ben, for your awesome uh, presentation. She really uh, enjoyed it. But I also see that Junior, your good colleague, has also responded to my earlier question. And he noted that paper documentations has decreased, uh, but this has not been cut out completely, considering that you, know, you have a lot of elderly people or non-technical personnel who still prefer to use uh, paper documents. Of course, yes. that's that's always the case. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. it's still sort of impressive, you know, 80% of your, you know. Yeah, so the other 20%, the other 20% that um, we still have paper available for them, but 80% is a big, big shift from what it was 100% um, paper uh, processing to now, Everything is online. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben, and of course, uh, your team, and also uh, Paul, for that excellent uh, discussion. There's been a lot of interest about you know these types of tools, especially by our uh, members and colleagues here in the region. So hopefully, you know this presentation can uh, today can stack that uh, discussion and maybe other countries thinking of how they can streamline their own uh, permitting systems for EIA, because I mean, it makes things better for everybody. You don't have to you know, drive around to go there and fill in the uh, physical paper. You can just do it from your home and the communication is streamlined and everything is just easier for everybody. So definitely uh, recommend it. But thank you so much uh, again, Benjamin and team. That was excellent. And I think that you know opens us up to our next uh, and last session for the day, which is just uh, you know a talanoa, and so to our participants online who've had some excellent uh, presentations today. We've heard about you know certification and registration of practitioners uh, across the region and how we can also 
sort of upgrade the practice uh, in the region. We also heard from Rosie about environmental and social management systems from the bank's perspective and also um, how they apply in some of our member countries. And of course, you know, we heard from Ben about the e-permitting system and tools that the Cook Islands is embracing. So please feel free to come online and, you know, uh, throw some questions to Ben or to Rosie or to, you know, any of us online. Let's have a, a discussion. What are your thoughts uh, from the sessions today? You Buddha. I'll pass it to you to kick it up. You know, what, what are any major takeaways? What's, what's something new that, you know, you, you heard today? Thank you, Mama Dina. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, our speakers, on the interesting uh, talks that you just uh, presented. That I think overall, we really uh, encourage our neighbor countries and uh, stakeholders uh, to further take a step to modernize the uh, yeah, EIA system in terms of the in terms of uh, the certification and registration of uh, EIA consultants and uh, also in terms of the the digital uh, digital uh, no or e permitting uh, system we really encourage our member countries and also to bring up their standards in terms of our uh, environmental and social management uh, system to, to international uh, standards such as the, the World Bank, the ADB, and, and uh, other, other international organizations that uh, you know, practice uh, based uh, Based sustainable uh, uh, practices. So I think this is the key message from from Spirit. We really encourage our member countries and stakeholders and environment uh, students to you know to modernize their system and uh, step up you know, their current uh, practices. So that's would be my key key message. Is a uh, point. Again, the floor is open, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please feel free. I know there's been a number of you who have been very active in the chat. Welcome to, you know, unmute yourselves, jump on. Of course, I know Margaret, uh, Victoria, you know, there's a whole number of you out there, so please feel free to make uh, join the discussion, please. Or maybe uh, just one more sort of question to, to Rosie. Uh, you were, during your presentation, I noticed that you were using the term ESHS and ESMS sort of interchangeably and quite a lot. And perhaps my question is, you know, are they interchangeable? Are they referring to the same thing or do they refer to uh, specific sort of uh, systems? It depends who you're talking to. So in the World Bank, when we say environment, we mean health and safety as well. However, I have a bit of a personal agenda that the health and safe, the worker health and safety stuff is really important to me. So I try and spell out the H and S as much as possible. Um, and that's why you saw me slipping it into the conversation there. Um, I think it, you know, it's it is really important. It deserves its own mention, not just to be a subsection of environment. And if you were talking from an industry point of view, like private sector, then they would also be separating it out, separating it out as its own separate issue. So somewhat interchangeable, but not really. Okay. Yes. Maybe uh, if I may, uh, another question to to see uh, 
how do you deal? How do uh, World Bank deal with the non compliance of uh, international uh, contractors? Any sanctions? Any? Uh, how do you deal with them? Thank you. So it's a bit of a challenge because we're not the one that engages the contractors. Um, if something very serious has happened with a contractor, then there is the opportunity, and I don't quite know how it works, but they can be blacklisted on um, bank finance projects. But really, we have to work with the implementing agency for how to address issues that we have. Because, you know, we can't issue a stop work. We can't issue, you know, we can't retain um, performance. What do you call it? You know, the money that's kept back, that sort of thing, because it's not sitting with us. So we just have to work carefully with the implementing agency to help them look at mechanisms they can use to do this. Um, and I like to ask before I go out on site if there are any messages that the implementing agency would like me to reinforce. Um, so that's another way. But yeah, it, it's tricky. We have to work with um, you guys to do that. We do have some internal bank things that we can do if the implementing agency aren't doing that. Um, but it's something we try and avoid if possible. So if there are serious non-compliances, then we may push the implementing agency a little bit by saying, you know, we won't disperse until you have sorted out that serious hazard because you shouldn't be working when that's going on. Um, but it's, you know, it's not an ideal, ideal situation. We want the projects to be implemented as well. So we'd rather work with you to fix up issues with the contractor. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, maybe I'll put somebody on the spot here. Um, I also see that we have uh, Director Hayden from uh, New Way, who's on the call. Hello, Director. Hope you can hear us. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan, for for that um yes um also to from hayden uh from uh, from new way um it's great to um see some um familiar faces and also um uh thank you also for the presentations even though i came late um it was very informative and also um uh, a lot of lessons that um that new way can learn um in regards to new ways um uh ess uh, we are just at the starting line um so we'll be working with um, consultants of the next few months to develop new as um, uh, environmental uh, safeguards and social safeguards. So um, we're working with the team at SPRIP. So looking forward to the consultant coming up new way and also um, working virtually um, to develop new as um, uh, standards. It's been a, it's been a, a journey. Uh, however, in regards to the EIA system, we have that in place. Um, however, we want to strengthen our systems by including the um, uh, elements from the environmental, uh, social, and uh, safeguards for Nui. So um, those few words, uh, thank you very much. And also um, to all the presenters, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, there was a lot of information to absorb and also to our uh, brothers up in Cook Islands, uh, well done. And also, um, uh, I'm sure, uh, our colleagues in the, the region will also have um, similar cards that we can learn from. So um, looking forward to more uh, online calls like this and also uh, learning from our colleagues in the region. So um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Director. That was, that was the best way to sort of sum it up <laughs> all together. <laughs> But uh, maybe just one more, you know, comment to Rosie, just piggybacking off uh, what director just uh, mentioned. Uh, you know, New Way, along with many other uh, Pacific Island countries, are trying to develop uh, ESMS sort of policy framework, and that is to assist with the accreditation, whether it's to the GCF or the uh, international sort of donor agencies, and that is a requirement to have an ESMS sort of in place. And going back to the presentation, uh, Rosie, do you see much difference between establishing sort of a national ESMS system for government as opposed to maybe one for an entity like you know a company or an organization 
Do you have experience and how do those two sort of differ? I'm going to have to admit to not having a lot of experience in the whole of government system. Um, when you're talking about government specific ministries or government agencies like a Rose Authority, then that is very similar to doing it for a private entity. You know, you're you're looking at the same thing. What are your risks and impacts? How are you going to manage it? How are you going to monitor that and review? I expect the principles apply to a whole of government approach, um, but I unfortunately don't have a lot of practical guidance for you there. Um, but yeah, similar thing. Think about what your risks and impacts are, how you're going to control them and prioritize what you focus on, I think, based on the significance and likelihood of those risks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosie. Just wanted to you know, have that distinction in how uh, they apply the national sort of whole of government uh, system, roping in, you know, the different agencies, the social, you know, ministries, the environment ministries, the health ministries, just to put together a holistic uh, management uh, system for ENS. So I think that's sort of the discussion that's happening a lot now on this region. But certainly your, your presentation was certainly uh, relevant and there's a lot of key takeaways in those discussions. So thank you. Thank you, Rosie. And I'm just looking across again. Um, I don't see any more comments or questions uh, from the floor. So I take it. Okay, I think I spoke too soon. I see Paul's hand up. So Paul, maybe uh, one last question from Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Rosie. Um, just going back to your, um, I think it's the uh, environment aspects and uh, impact register. Um, very interested in your, um, your, your, your. I think you got like seven um, key um, headings in, in your uh, table: uh, aspects, impacts, serialty, likelihood, significant score legislation and control. Um, more or less, I think, just asking if there's examples or um, places where we can go through. I'm more interested in the, the severity and likelihood um, that generates this force. Um, we've done a lot of um, impact registers here, but I'm, I'm keen to have that aligned to, to this, just to improve um, how we capture some of the, some of the impacts that we have the cool violence. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and good question. So I'm dragging my memory a little bit, but I think there's also an ISO standard for risk management. So that would be a place to start looking for calibrating your risk assessments. Um, it's really important that you have your risk matrix prepared and agreed with your senior management before you start assessing the um, risk severity. So that would be my advice for getting consistency. Um, not just having the matrix, but having the definitions as well and some guidance. There's a lot of guidance out there, but if you have a look on the ISO sites first, they'll provide you some examples and guidance about how to do that. Does that answer the question or did I miss something? And I know that the ISO, eh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like ISO, but there are lots of other examples out there. If you Google, environmental aspects and impacts register, you'll start seeing, you know, a lot of the big international companies will disclose them. So you'd be able to see examples that way and they should include their um, risk matrixes there. Oh, thank you. All right, colleagues, I note that um... It's getting uh, late here, but uh, we've exhausted our time and, of course, uh, our speaker's time today. So maybe we have to call a close to our program today. Uh, just from my end, I'd just like to say a big thank you to our speakers, uh, Stephanie, who's not here with us now, but also Rosie and Ben. Thank you so much for joining us today and for really enlightening us uh, the discussions that uh, you have shared. We'll certainly be reaching out to you guys uh, to join us for another session and to share 
sort of more of your, your knowledge and um, experience. And uh, with that, I would like to pass it on to my good friend, uh, Huta, just to close us up uh, today. Thank you, moderator. Uh, thanks so much for your excellent uh, guidance and uh, know how to stimulate so, uh, the discussions with this uh, with Nanda. Colleagues, as we conclude uh, today's uh, webinar on behalf of SPRIT, I want to thank our speakers, our participants for their valuable uh, contributions. Uh, the insights here today are uh, instrumental in advancing uh, EIA practices in our region. So remember to stay connected to the PMEA uh, network for more updates and future uh, similar events. Thank you and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mugaret. Thank you, Buta. Short, sweet, and simple. <laughs> so that's uh, brings a close to our program today, ladies and gentlemen. And I also believe this is our last webinar for this year. But certainly stay tuned and we'll be bringing you more of such uh, engaging Talanoas uh, in the next year. So from us, I uh, wish you all uh, happy holidays and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Everyone, Taki, Taki, different group of islands. Taki, Taki. Thank you, Director Hayden. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. I don't know how to say goodbye uh, in Mongolian. Uh, Rosie, maybe you can help oh, us. How do I yet? I'll be able to tell you by the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rosie. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ivan. Mission, mission. Uh...